so I am Elise Giuliano. I'm a political science professor here at Columbia University and uh, director of the program, the master's program on Russian and Eurasian um, relations. And the, um, we will be um, honored to have our guests here um, to speak to us today. We have Ann Cooper, who is also a Columbia University professor emerita at the journalism school. We have Roman Badalin, who is founder and editor in chief of Project, uh, the recently um, re recently um, founded investigative outlet Agenstva, and we have Galina Arapova, um, who is a director of the NGO Mass Media Defense Center and a practicing media lawyer. I will um, provide longer introductions in one moment, but I'd also just like to say a few words um, about the um, format of today's panel. Um, the format will be an interview. It'll be a conversation um, with Ann Cooper and our guests. And after the interview, we will move to a question and answer period with our um, guests in the, in the room here in the seminar room at Columbia. And then if you are joining us virtually, please um, write your questions if you're on Zoom in the Q&A box. And if you are joining us virtually on um, YouTube, then please write your questions in the chat. Okay, so I wanted to say a few words um, about why we decided to organize this panel. Um, we all here are probably familiar with the challenge that independent media has faced in Russia over the past few years. But over the past year, um, we can really say that this is the most difficult circumstance since the advent of independent media in the country. And we will be talking about how the Kremlin has expanded its use of coercion under the guise of legalistic categories, such as undesirable organizations, and of course, a foreign agent um, appellation. So journalists and media professionals and media organizations now are confronting a set of really serious challenges. So some of the questions we'll talk about today are how do journalists continue their professional work? How do they interact with state authorities while defending um, freedom of expression as well as uh, taking care of their personal security? Um, and then we will also engage with the more general question of the role of media in Russia today under the current political conditions. With that, I would like to provide a, a fuller introduction of our guests. And I will begin um, with Galina Arapova. Galina is an expert on media law and has worked in the field of freedom of expression and freedom of information in Russia since 1996. She is director and senior media lawyer at the Mass Media Defense Center, which is a prominent Russian freedom of expression and media protection NGO. She's a practicing media lawyer with extensive experience in defending media and journalists in domestic courts as well as before the European Court of Human Rights. She has also trained journalists and lawyers and judges in Russia and in other CIS countries, as well as in Eastern Europe. She's a member of multiple um, NGOs, including the Russian Press Council. She's a board member of the European Center for Press and Media Freedom in Germany. She's a member of the, an advisor of the high level panel of legal experts on media freedom. And for over 12 years, she has been a trustee and a vice chair on the international board of the media freedom organization, Article 19, based in London. She was awarded a special um, freedom of expression protection award from the Russian Union of Journalists and the Anna Polikovskaya Freedom of Media Prize for Courage in Media Defense. She was also a 2016 winner of the International Bar Association Award for Outstanding Contribution by a Legal Practitioner to Human Rights. Our next guest is Raman Badanin, who is currently John S. Knight Senior International Fellow at Stanford University, and of course, the founder and editor of the recently established investigative media outlet Agenstva, and the former editor of the outlet project. Both of these projects focus on data journalism and investigate topics such as the current corrupt relations between authorities and oligarchs. 
and the Kremlin's control over the information space. Prior to Payet, Radanin worked at Dost, RBC, and the Russian edition of Forbes magazine as an editor-in-chief. He's also worked at Gazeta.ru as deputy editor-in-chief, and he has been affiliated with the Gorbachev Foundation and the Russian Academy of Sciences as a researcher. And finally, I'd like to introduce Anne Cooper. She's an award-winning journalist and former executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. And she is Professor Emerita at Columbia's Journalism School. Her voice was well known to national public radio listeners as NPR's first Moscow bureau chief, covering the tumultuous events of the final five years of Soviet communism. She co-edited a book, Russia at the Barricades, about the failed 1991 coup attempt. And as a spring 2020 fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Shorenstein Center, she published the book, Conveying Truth, Independent Media in Putin's Russia, which traces the history of independent Russian media from the Glasnost era to the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you, Anne. And with that, um, I will ask Anne to begin the conversation. Okay. You have to put your mask on, so I'm put my allowed mask. to take mine off, I guess. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Elise, and thank you so much, Ramon and Galina, for being with us. Um, you know, Vladimir Putin's been in power for more than two decades, and there is not a single period in his rule that you could call good for press freedom or for independent media. So it's kind of a miracle that, you know, independent journalism has survived in Russia. And in fact, in the last few years, um, in fact, going up to the time I finished that Shorenstein Center report, it was beginning to flower. There were journalists like Roman Badanin who had founded new investigative sites, um, other news sites, um, exploring how to build audience, doing some hard hitting reporting, and also exploring some techniques that gave them some protection from Kremlin interference. But not only some protection. And now here we are in yet another era of repression against independent media. This time, the Russian government's favorite tool is the foreign agents law. It's not new. It's been around for some years. Um, uh, the Kremlin has used it to try to silence Memorial, um, groups fighting for LGBTQ rights and other causes. And some media, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, was designated a foreign agent a while ago. So was the Mass Media Defense Center in Voronezh. Um, but then this spring, things got much more aggressive, starting in April with the naming of the Riga-based site Medusa as a foreign agent. Both of our guests today um, have been labeled foreign agents uh, in this new repressive wave. And we'll talk more about who's been targeted and why. But I want to ask Roman and Galina to start out by helping us understand the definitions in these laws. Um, and I say laws because foreign agents and undesirable, uh, which is what project was, was named, um, and what some of the repercussions are. So Roman, you personally are now designated a foreign agent, but project was called undesirable. And in the order announcing that, it says it was, uh, it was because Proyekt threatens the foundations of the constitutional order and security of Russia. Um, so help us understand the difference between undesirable and foreign agent, which is uh, the label that now has to be attached to Medusa, Media Zona, TV Doge, and, and so many others. Uh... Okay, first of all, thank you all for having us here today and greetings from California. It's not so sunny here as it meant to be. Uh, well, uh, you are completely right. Uh, it is a big bunch of new draconian legislation uh, which was adopted in Russia like during, I don't know, like 15 years, uh, past 15 years uh, and among as a bad laws, uh, there are two of great importance. One is uh, the so-called foreign agents law, and the second is the law 
on undesirable organization. Uh, uh, well, uh, let's start with the with the foreign agents law. Uh, as it seems to me, the main idea behind this law is to make uh, the life of journalists or civil activists uh, as difficult as it possible. Uh, someone has already compared this law with the uh, law on Jews in Nazi Germany in uh, 30s. Uh, as you know, the Jews uh, in Germany at that time uh, were obliged to attach uh, the yellow uh, David stars on their clothes. It's something like of the same type. Uh, every single rule of this law makes uh, the life of journalists much way more harder uh, than previously. Uh, and well, and one additional idea behind this law is uh, to humiliate the journalists in Russia, to make them enemies for the rest of Russian society, to create this image of enemies uh, for the Russian society. Uh, and, you know, this uh, stupid and humiliating disclaimer, you know what I'm talking about, disclaimer, every single foreign agent should post uh, the humiliating disclaimer every time he publishes something in his social media, for example. Uh, this uh, disclaimer consists of, I don't remember the, uh, like, uh, 30 words or something like that. Uh, like this, uh, I don't know, this message was produced uh, by the media working as a foreign agent. Uh, so this message, it seems like this disclaimer is not a big deal, but in fact, just imagine the Twitter Twitter is one of the most important platforms for Russian media. And every single message in Twitter uh, consists only 100 or something like that words. And just imagine that, well, Medusa, the biggest Russian news media right now, independent news media, uh, they should post this disclaimer in Twitter every time they want to, to post their news in Twitter. It makes just impossible to use Twitter for uh, this person, the information. Uh, as for the undesirable legislation, uh, it's way more simple and way more serious at the same time. Uh, the only aim of this legislation is just to eliminate uh, the organizations the Kremlin wants to eliminate uh, because being an undesirable in Russia effectively bans all the activity inside Russia because uh, every type of activity, I don't know, financing the undesirable organization, uh, collaborating in any way with, collabor uh, with undesirable organization, all these are illegal in legal terms in Russia and all these, uh, doing all these, uh, you risk uh, going to prison in Russia. Uh, so long story short, Galina is more like, uh, knows much more in legal terms about this legislation. But as it seems to me, the aim of the foreign agents law is to make the li our life harder the aim of the undesirable law is just to to kill us. Yeah. So Galina, you actually have had more experience with the foreign agent law because the Mass Media Defense Center was named, was it around 2017 or? Um, 2015. Uh -huh. Okay. So describe for us what impact that had on the center and its work 
Um, and also, you know, now you as an individual have been named foreign agent. How does that impact you both personally and professionally? Um, uh, first of all, I also would like to thank for inviting for this uh, important dialogue. And uh, it's uh, nice to see you again. And it's, it's lovely, lovely to, to be again, even virtually um, on, on uh, participating in this discussion together. So uh, I completely support what Armand just said, and uh, this legislation is uh, um, uh, designed in a way that it's not just shaming and naming, it's uh, creating obstacles for uh, media outlets, for journalists, for lawyers, for NGOs to uh, deliver their work, uh, an important uh, work for, in name of uh, civil society, first of all. So, and it's, it's, of course, it's a political instrument that authorities are using against civil society and media, which now plays a vital role to um, underline uh, critical issues in uh, all spheres of uh, Russian uh, life. Uh, and of course, uh, when it comes to um, uh, uh, investigative journalism or anti-corruption researchers or human rights defenders. Uh, this is something that authorities doesn't want to, to, to have around them. They don't want to listen to this. They don't want this to be published, to be communicated to Russian society, to international community. That's why all these uh, uh, instruments are used. And uh, legislation um, is um, is actually based. Uh, it's 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 located in different provisions of uh, different laws. And uh, in uh, 2012, when Russian legislation legislation first uh, uh, heard this um, this notion, this term um, uh, for an agent, that was quite uh, weird because uh, in Russian language, uh, for an agent sounds really, really negative. It's a, a synonym of, of spy uh, or someone who betrays uh, the motherland uh, acting in favor or in, uh, in service of some other countries' uh, governments. Uh, and of course, uh, for any Russian speaker, this, uh, this term sounds really, really bad. And uh, that was actually the, the whole idea to pick the term which would not be uh, neutral, which would be extremely negative uh, when it's ex ex heard or ex uh, somehow um, accepted by Russian, Russian public. And in 2012, when this uh, legislation was first introduced, a Russian authorities said, uh, communicated to Russian public that we, and, and they still do, they actually still refer to this, that uh, we were not the first ones who started this, uh, to use this, uh, this uh, regulation. It was actually United States uh, which uh, introduced uh, uh, foreign agent registration act in back in almost like 100 years ago in 1938 and FARA so-called FARA law is some, one of the biggest um, arguments uh, which, uh, which is being used uh, by Russian authorities on, like on, almost on a daily basis. And uh, they say that when the United States will stop using FARA law against Russian media, uh, particularly RT, uh, which is uh, quite uh, strong, uh, strong uh, around the world uh, and uh, is, is totally funded by Russian uh, Russian government. So that that was uh, the instrument which was used symmetrically, as they said, like it was a mirror instrument used against Russian media and Russian so civil society as an answer to United States uh, for uh, aggressive application of uh, FARA law against RT in the United States. Now we see that it's not just about RT, it's uh, this instrument uh, happened to be quite handy and it's used against first human rights defenders and uh, around 100 Russian NGOs working in all sorts uh, all uh, different uh, areas of human rights defense have been designated as foreign agent NGOs, including my organization, which is working uh, in the field of uh, freedom of expression and media rights protection for the last 25 years. And uh, we've been designated in 2015 uh, 
before us and after us uh, all respected and strong Russian majority of respected and strong Russian NGOs have been designated. And we all challenged this status in the court of law and domestic level. And we all went to the European Court of Human Rights because this is the only uh, place where the only court instrument that remedy that we can use to actually gain uh, fair trial uh, and uh, justice back uh, in this case. Now we see that this, uh, this similar legislation have been passed in, in the law on mass media and now is used against media and journalists in the law, which is uh, called Dima Yakovlev law, which was passed again in 2012 and was used to, ba to basically, first it was used against um, uh, adoption of Russian orphans kids by uh, American, uh, American citizens, which was by itself was uh, absolutely horrible legislation. But now uh, this legislation is used uh, because, uh, again uh, against um, anyone who Russian authorities don't like uh, and uh, undesirable organization provision is actually in this law. And the title of this law uh, itself is sounds quite negative. Uh, it sounds like uh, about um, the law on measures of uh, uh, the, the, the influence uh, on, uh, on, on people who are uh, involved in violation of human rights in Russia, something like that, if uh, I would translate it like uh, uh, right away. Uh, so uh, all the, the, these, these provisions are quite uh, uh, aggressive towards uh, civil society and Russian NGOs who are existing with this legislation for already quite a while, they are facing discrimination. We are all, all waiting for decisions to be delivered by the European court. Uh, we are trying to cope with uh, all the administrative and financial burdens and legal risks that Russian NGOs uh, and human rights defenders are facing due to this legislation. And the last, we, uh, well, the last few days actually brought us really negative news that a uh, general prosecutor of the Russian Federation uh, filed claim to terminate activity of the oldest Russian NGO called uh, Memorial and the whole network of Memorial mm -hmm. NGOs, including Human Rights uh, Memorial Center, which is working on violation of uh, uh, the right to life and uh, uh, other rights in North Caucasus and who are working on um, historical um, uh, saving of uh, history about repressions and uh, gaining uh, justice back to those who've been repressed uh, by Soviet uh, authorities. So this is like a really crucial uh, work in, uh, uh, in human rights field. So these organizations are facing uh, termination of their activity and uh, the court hearings are uh, scheduled really fast, like in a, week in a week time, we will have a court hearing when the claim was actually filed just last week. So like a couple of weeks and the work is done. So we see that that same approach might be used against other NGOs. Uh, and uh, Raman joked in his Facebook that, um, Facebook post that uh, they, as, as long as they don't use termination uh, against uh, uh, individuals, we are on a safe side, but we don't really know what, uh, whether it's um, uh, this sense of humor is, uh, um, would, would s save us in, in this situation because this is something that we still try to uh, use every day, but we do understand that legal risks are really, really high. And that's why some journalists are living in the country, uh, NGOs are facing uh, multiple case, uh, cases in courts, and we are tr still trying to provide our assistance to those who cannot go to the court themselves, like journalists, like Raman, for instance. Uh, so that's uh, the work, like everyday work of Russian uh, human rights NGOs at the moment. Right. So, you know, we've seen these waves of repression around certain events, the 2012 elections, uh, the invasion of, of Eastern Ukraine. Um, what sparked this, do you think? And, and, and it's so, you know, it, it came on pretty suddenly and now it seems like every few weeks there are more designations of independent media 
as foreign agents, more journalists name that. And, you know, Dmitry Muratov gets the Nobel Peace Prize. And a few hours later, they said, yeah, here are some more independent media foreign agents. Uh, why? why? Why now? <laughs> well, uh, it's a really brilliant question with no such a brilliant answer, you know. Uh, uh, we spent a long time thinking about it, but well, uh, I can figure out at least four potential reasons why this happened this year. Uh, uh, long story short, uh, two first reasons uh, are interconnecting. Uh, it's all about election campaigns. Uh, this year, uh, we have had uh, a parliamentary election, very controversial as always, uh, last September. Uh, and in two years ahead, we will have even more important electoral campaign. Uh, in 2024, we will have presidential election. Uh, and of course, it's kind of, as we joke, it's kind of old Russian tradition to clean up everything, to clean up, I mean, uh, to clean up journalists, to clean up activists, to clean up opposition activity prior to any big elections. And that's why I believe the Kremlin decided to clean up uh, the political landscape before the election. Uh, because, well, uh, the next Putin's re-election will be not easy for the authorities. And that's why they need to prepare for this election as early as possible. Uh, the next potential reason is everything what has happened to Alexei Navalny this year. Uh, very briefly, uh, first he was presumably poisoned by the authorities uh, almost to death. And then after his recovery, he was illegally imprisoned. Uh, well, just imagine, first they tried to poison him and then imprison him. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, like, a year ago, we as project, we investigated a very interesting story, the history of repression against Navalny and his team during the last several years. And among other things, among other discoveries, we established that Russian authorities always were always afraid to do something crucial to Mr. Navalny because they believed that if they for example, imprison him, it will be big rallies on the street in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and it can make the situation unstable. And this year, all of a sudden, they imprisoned him, first poisoned and then imprisoned, and nothing like this happened. I mean, we didn't see any big rallies on Moscow streets. We didn't see like any uh, big protests, uh, like, well, they, they understood like, well, if we can do all these dirty things to Navalny, why we can do all these dirty things to all the other political activists across the country before the election? It was like a aha moment for them. They decided, okay, let's try to do that. And the last but not the least reason is what is going on in Belarus, in Belarus. Uh, we know that the Kremlin watches what is going on in Belarus very closely. Uh, and of course, the Kremlin helps somehow in one way or another. They help uh, Lukashenko's regime uh, in different ways. Like we know that uh, the Russian law enforcement bodies trained Belarus security services and all that things. Uh, but at the same time, the Kremlin learns a lot from the events in Belarus. And what they, what they like witnessed last August, it was really mm, nervous for them 
they realized that really big amount of Belarusian people are ready to protest against Lukashenko. They are ready to go to the streets. And it was really like, it was really scary moment for the Kremlin. And maybe this influenced them a lot. And that's why they decided to like, to oppress the opposition beforehand, like to start it this summer. So I see this for potential reason, but uh, again, we don't know for sure why, maybe there is something why they decided to poison Navalny last last year. It is the most like interesting question, why they decided to eliminate him a year ago, very prior to the parliamentary election. Uh, uh, I don't like conspiracy theories. Uh, for example, someone says like, uh, Putin is ready to quit. That's why they, they need like uh, to clean up the political landscape before he quits. Uh, I don't believe so. Well, uh, but for sure there is something uh, which makes them nervous this year or even last year. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Galina, any particular thoughts on this? Um, I'm not an uh, expert on policy or the politics, but uh, what I would just add to what uh, Raman said is uh, that there is uh, uh, a strong uh, tendency that Russia is uh, trying at some points to act proactive. Uh, and uh, from my perspective as a lawyer, uh, I see this uh, proactive uh, um, uh, strategy in uh, uh, internet regulation. And uh, Russia is trying to control uh, internet, Russian segment of internet as much as possible. And now this year uh, it introduced uh, legislation that requires uh, giant IT, uh, IT giants, uh, ma- mainly US based uh, Facebook, Google uh, to uh, coordinate their activity uh, when it comes uh, to public pub- publication information in Russian languages for the uh, targeted targeting Russian audience and Russian market uh, coordinate this activity uh, with Russian media regulator and this is something new uh, because it's not that many countries around the globe uh, which are trying to uh, run that fast and, re- and introduced uh, internet regulation, uh, but Russia did and did it in a way that it's quite harsh. Uh, it requires uh, a lot to, uh, to deliver uh, by administrations of fa- Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter. They have to actually, they, they've been uh, already designated as uh, sh- social media uh, in a special registry, uh, which is uh, uh, run by um, Russian media regu- regulator called, called Roskomnadzor. They have to open offices in Moscow. Uh, if they have to comply with Russian uh, content uh, ban restriction uh, legislation. Uh, and if Russian regulator requires uh, to uh, take off, uh, take, take down uh, publications uh, in social media or uh, on any website which is registered in U- U.S., for instance, jurisdictions or anywhere else outside Russia. So authorities uh, uh, require administrations of these uh, uh, platforms to comply with Russian regulation. Uh, if and if they would not, they would be first uh, fined on a moderate sum. Uh, then higher sum and then one tenth of the annual income, uh, which is a lot. So this financial pressure is something which again is used by not many countries around the world. It's just uh, a few in Europe, uh, namely Germany, which uh, has uh, well, which introduced regulation uh, pushing uh, IT giants to cooperate and Russia. Uh, and, and Russia is uh, 
delivering uh, this legislation and implementing these uh, provisions quite fast, which also is a big question why they do it, why they've done it without uh, communication with experts, why they've done it without uh, a proper dialogue with uh, uh, platforms, uh, with international experts community. So this is something that together with uh, foreign agent legislation, undesirable organizations legislation, with the uh, pressure on political opposition, all that uh, creates this hostile atmosphere in media field and civil society in Russia. And uh, people don't feel themselves that uh, free online anymore. Anonymously online is, uh, is not anymore in Russia. Uh, people do understand that they uh, have to uh, keep their mouths shut in many cases uh, because they are afraid and this atmosphere of fear is all around. Uh, and it's, as you see, it's uh, supported by different means. It's not just uh, designation of uh, some journalists as, uh, as uh, foreign agents. Uh, so in now it's like around 100 people are, uh, and organizations who've been designated as foreign media, foreign agents. Uh, in, for the whole country where it's uh, um, around one. 40, 140 million people population. It's not that many. So it's not that every single um, citizen would really understand that it's something, that something wrong is going on uh, because it's, uh, he might not hear of that or he might not know anyone who have been designated as a foreign agent and doesn't understand what that what what that would mean uh, on a personal level so it's not that uh, so that's that's why probably authorities are using all these different uh, uh means and instruments to put pressure on civil society and media uh and uh, they all complement unfortunately each other and uh, that creates uh, this uh, quite uh a crisis i would say uh in in this field at the moment probably the biggest one that i observe uh, during 25 years of my professional experience. Yeah. And sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I'm going to add something. Uh, answering your question, what was the reason behind this crackdown? Uh, well, in a very broad way, uh, we, I mean, journalists, uh, we are joking about uh, all this crackdown as of anti agent therapy. We call it anti agent therapy meaning that the Kremlin is really afraid of Putin who is getting older. And they understand perfectly that one day or like in one year or two years, or I don't know how many years, uh, well, he will not be so popular. He will be older. And they're trying to avoid the scenario of early 80s when the Soviet regime was getting older and uh, it was a lack of money at the same, uh, at that time in Soviet Union. And all this provoked the perestroika and they just want to avoid new perestroika beforehand, very in advance. Uh, so that's why it's my guess. Uh, we have nothing to prove it, but anyway, mm -hmm. they are preparing for the very old Putin, mm -hmm. for very old Putin, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so it, it, it's interesting to see that, you know, Russian journalists do maintain some sense of humor about this, but it is obviously a very serious situation. And Galina, a little while ago, you were talking about the European Court of Human Rights. What difference would it make if the European Court of Human Rights came out and said, this is a travesty, you know, you can't call all these people foreign agents and, uh, you know, humiliate them and try to silence them in this way. Does Russia care? I mean, well, does the Russian government care? I do understand your question because this is something that we, uh, among the lawyers even, uh, we have this discussion and uh, not everyone is... Uh, actually uh, um, uh, at the same mood that uh, it's an important decision that we have to get from the European court because uh, people are burnt out 
employers do see that crisis in uh, judiciary and lack of fair trial is a uh, crucial problem now. And uh, particularly those who do not practice before the European court, they don't, don't really understand why they would use the instrument which takes years. Uh, but uh, Russia, uh, it, it's, it's both legal and political answer to this. Uh, and I'll start from a legal one. Uh, Russia is a part of Council of Europe. It's a, a member state to this big and influential European community of countries. And uh, Russian authorities, they do like to be members of this club. They do play uh, with uh, and put pressure on Council of Europe uh, as they always do in, on, on the level of UN. Um, but uh, they still understand the importance of being in this club. Because otherwise, two years ago, when it was a huge discussion and Russia was about to be kicked out of the Council of Europe, they wouldn't actually play the way they did. And they actually tried to stay regardless of all the economical and political circumstances. Uh, so for some reasons, again, I don't, I am not, uh, uh, specialist on uh, politics, but I still think that they, it's, it's in favor for them to stay in a club of uh, decent countries, because otherwise they would be on uh, somewhere on, uh, on suburbs of this world uh, and somewhere with, uh, uh, with, with those countries who are not always invited to uh, big, uh, big level um, dialogues, let's say. So this is the first reason why it's important because European court is a legal and the only legal instrument of the, Euro of the Council of Europe. And it's the only uh, international court which could be used by Russian citizens to challenge any decision taken by Russian authorities because they promised by uh, ratifying European convention, they did promise, they took international obligations and promise to deliver to uh, fulfill these obligations uh, in any situation when human rights are concerned. So in this case, it's 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 not um, just uh, a political game; it's a legal uh, process. And uh, yes, it takes years, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think you mentioned that there is a case now before the court. So. What is the timing of that? When would you expect a decision? Uh, so we, uh, it's, it's a big case. It's a case which joins uh, applications from 61. It's two actual two cases. Uh, it's uh, application, 61 applications from 61 uh, Russian NGOs uh, joined in one case and uh, communication stage and the whole legal proceedings and exchange of uh, observations for legal uh, positions between applicants and uh, the responding state uh, that ended in March 2018. So we are expect the, the case is pending. So we are expecting expecting decision anytime. <laughs> like basically, we do hope that it will come soon enough uh, before we all uh, eliminate it here uh, in media and uh, human rights field. But still, uh, for some reason, European Court is uh, taking its time. To deliver the judgment, uh, and uh, I do ha have some uh, uh, suggestions why, some guess why why they're doing so. It's also uh, could be uh, uh, an instrument, a card in political game between uh, uh, Russia and uh, Council of Europe. But still, legally speaking, uh, proceedings are over, and uh, a decision could be delivered any any time soon. Uh, second case, uh, which uh, joins uh, another 27 applications, uh, which was just filed later on a later stage. Uh, so these, I think, proceedings are uh, over uh, again and the uh, case should be decided uh, soon again. Uh, and uh, cases of individuals, foreign agents, individuals, uh, they are still on domestic stage. Like Roman's case uh, is uh, about to be heard this Friday in the court of law in Moscow, and our lawyer is representing him. And the other journalists who've been designated as foreign agents, uh, their case is just about to start 
uh, hearings, court hearings in Moscow. That means that it will take us for another year, about a year on domestic stage, and then we will apply to the European court. So we might expect decisions on the, the crackdown to this year crackdown in the European court, like in three years. But as I say, uh, justice has no deadlines and no time limits. So uh, it's important to get justice whenever it, it will be right. taken. Right. Roman, you wrote uh, an essay for the Washington Post and you were calling for international help from colleagues, governments, uh, international organizations. And one of the things you talked about was Facebook, uh, YouTube and Twitter need to open a dialogue with Russian journalists. Can you elaborate on that? And also what, you know, what other forms of support are there that would have some meaning or, or could potentially be helpful at this point? Uh, well, first of all, on behalf of all the Russian journalists, uh, I appreciate all the support uh, and uh, all the interest uh, that international community uh, shows. Uh, and talking specifically on uh, big tech issue, as we call it, well, I would say it's the biggest challenge uh, for Russian media right now, because uh, the social platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Telegram, uh, VK, uh, it's the Russian analog of uh, Facebook. Uh, if the, all these are only platforms the Russian independent media can rely on, because we don't have access to, uh, to Russian mainstream media. Uh, we cannot get traffic, get audience from the, I don't know, news aggregators like Yandex News, for example, which is the most popular one in Russia. Uh, that's why it's very important what the position uh, big tech companies have right now. And we can see that in many cases, uh, the big tech companies like Facebook, Apple, uh, and Google, uh, well, they, uh, I don't know how to call it. Like, uh, for example, if you know the case of uh, Navalny organization, FBK, uh, Google and Apple, uh, they removed the app uh, for smart voting. It's Umne Galasavani uh, from the App Store and Google Store because of the pressure from the Russian authorities. Uh, Google then returned the app to the Google store, but well, it doesn't matter. In some cases, it seems like uh, uh, the big tech companies, uh, they care about its income much more than about basic human rights. Uh, and that's why it's only part of the it's only part of the problem. The second part is, well, the big tech companies uh, which operate in Russia, they are really slow, or sometimes they didn't answer at all uh, to the civil society complaints, uh, to our questions. They are not communicative enough talking to journalists, to civil society organizations. That's why my idea is to to convince them to start this dialogue because they are only ones, again, uh, who we can rely on. Saying we, I mean Russian journalists and Russian activists. Uh -huh. Who else? Who else can help and in what ways? That uh, would actually potentially make some difference at this point. I guess the global governments who can help us to convince big tech companies to start a dialogue with us. Okay. And academic community as well. So. It also might be um, a dialogue on level of um, uh, intergovernmental organizations such as Council of Europe, United Nations, 
And uh, uh, if you look at uh, um, Council of Europe, uh, I, I think it was a recommendation by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. It's a special recommendation on the inter inter intermediary, uh, uh, intermediary uh, obligations and uh, duties and responsibilities, uh, which is an extremely important document uh, from a legal point of view, which actually points out that uh, platforms uh, and internet providers, they are providing services, but according to their role in uh, media, uh, media field and uh, just providing technical means for dissemination of information online and for uh, free exchange of opinion and information, their role is crucial and they have to remember that. So it's not just about business. So mm -hmm. these uh, legal documents are already there. Uh, it's a question whether the, these uh, big tech companies, they do pay attention to these uh, documents. So these documents exist on a European level because it's a Council of Europe document, but uh, do uh, is anything like that on the UN level, uh, on level where actually, uh, where US-based big tech companies could be um, influenced, uh, influenced somehow by, um, intergovernment organizations and by the big governments and authorities uh, on all levels, not just uh, administrations of these uh, businesses. So this uh, dialogue actually might in include uh, many actors. And it's not, just, uh, it's not just about Russia. It's about many other countries which are uh, using now, civil society of which are using now social media as probably the last uh, mean of uh, free exchange of uh, information and uh, free flow of information. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, yes, it's uh, maybe these companies started as business, but it, they're not anymore. They're not just business anymore. They created like cross-border jurisdiction because of uh, uh, services they provide and uh, rules they introduce uh, within this community and uh, their influence in uh, information world is huge. So they have to gain this, uh, these uh, obligations uh, and respect that. Otherwise, uh, many countries and the civil society representatives and journalists and media, independent media might lose this uh, platform as uh, sometimes the only way to communicate to, to people. That's, that's important to realize. So this dialogue is actually uh, crucial. I, I wonder about you know, press freedom groups. Does the Russian government pay any attention to Committee to Protect Journalists, Reporters Without Borders? I mean, they seem to be, um, they seem to, the government seemed to want to deliver quite a message after that Nobel Peace Prize announcement. Um, Muratov even asked, you know, will I be designated a foreign agent and never got an answer. Um, it seems, it feels like there's a sense of impunity on the side of the government at this point. With all my respect, uh, statements of uh, CPJ or Reporters on Frontiers or some other media groups, uh, uh, international media groups, uh, is not that uh, important for Russian government at the moment. They used to react differently, but that was like 10, 15 years ago. Now uh, they don't even pay, sometimes they don't pay attention. Sometimes they even use it against us, saying that, see, this uh, American-based organization is supporting them. Of course, they are foreign agents. So it doesn't mean that uh, international community should not do that. They do. They have to uh, show this support and solidar solidarity, but uh, we do not expect uh, proper reaction from Russian authorities. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a matter of uh, advocacy, how to use this, uh, this uh, um, public statements and uh, uh, solidarity instruments uh, to support Russian journalists, media and civil society the most effective way. So it's not just uh, how it used to be, unfortunately. Yeah, okay. We're gonna go to questions in a minute, but Roman, I just wanted to ask you one last thing to tell us about your plans for against the, the, the site is 
up and running. Tell us more about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, well, long story short, uh, as you know, maybe audience knows it as well, but uh, again, it was Prayak, the investigative media. Uh, I found it about three years ago, and we focused on the most tabooed and uh, socially important topics like corruption, uh, like uh, healthcare system problems, uh, and so. Uh, and one day this year, and we, we did a lot of really sensitive and really important stuff, including some really hard investigations uh, about Putin closed circle and uh, their wealth. And because of all of that, uh, this year we became like uh, target number one for Russian authorities. Uh, first, they charge us with the criminal libel. Uh, then they raided our apartments and brought us for interrogation. And finally, they designated project as undesirable and labeled most of our employees, including me as foreign agents. And they didn't stop at that point, even now. Uh, for example, some of our ex-employees uh, they're still under threat. They're still prosecuted by the Russian authorities. And for example, one of my ex-colleagues just recently, uh, he was forced to leave the country because he was followed, consistently followed on Moscow streets. And that's why he decided uh, it's more safe to leave the country right now. Uh, and why, when we were proclaimed as undesirable, uh, we were forced. We were forced to stop our activity in Russia because, uh, well, everybody who is collaborating with Prayak, uh, he risks uh, to end up in jail, uh, and that's why we established a new entity. It is called Agentstvo. Uh, it's a little bit of joke here. Uh, Agentstvo, foreign agents and agency as Agentstvo. Uh, so, our idea is quite the same. We want to focus on the most tabooed and most sensitive investigative stuff and big data. Uh, and we are struggling right now with all this situation because, again, first of all, we forced to relocate most of our stuff from Russia uh, to safer and disclosed location somewhere in Europe. Uh, and we were forced to, to start our operations from abroad, which is not easy. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, now we have a group of up to 10 people uh, who are ready, even in these harsh circumstances, to do our job. Uh, well, let's see. And follow us, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm going to mask up again so you can. Okay. Thank you for this uh, really interesting set of comments, and um, I want to turn to the audience, uh, but I also just want to ask about this um, reporting that I read this morning um, in Medusa that the representatives of the Russian Union of Journalists and the Presidential Human Rights Council have prepared amendments to Russia's foreign agent legislation that would soften the legislation. And they are submitting them to Duma member Alexander Kienstein, who's head of the State Duma Committee of Informational Policy. Um, and these, these kind of amendments will have to do with um, removing the ability of individuals to be labeled um, foreign language, uh, foreign agents, I believe, and, um, and, and giving NGOs and individuals three months to eliminate the claims, um, which are the supposed basis uh, for the authorities labeling an NGO a foreign agent in the first place. So I wonder, I just wanted to hear what you think about this. Um, if, you, if you've heard about this reporting and what you think about this, is this a promising development that NGOs are starting to push back? Or do you think this is some kind of um, political theater and uh, just something that kind of makes it look like there's some kind of engagement for civil society when we really know what the outcome 
of the proposed amendments might be? Well, uh, very, very, very briefly, uh, as a journalist with more than 20 years of experience in political reporting in Russia, I would say I don't believe in this attempt. Uh, because while well, the State Duma, Mr. Hinstein personally, they are not the decision makers in this, uh, in this field at all. Mr. Putin and his circle uh, and his close circle and FSB, they are stakeholders in this uh, in this policy, and they don't want to change this legislation. They want us uh, to bury ourselves in this discussion for years. They want us uh, to argue with each other about this legislation but they don't want to change it. That's the problem. Uh, and, you know, as a journalist and as an editor, I believe that uh, journalists should write articles, not the petitions. That's why me personally, I didn't sign this petition against the uh, foreign agents law because I see this unproductive, fruitless completely. So... That's my answer. Sorry for a little bit of pessimism here. Thank you. I probably have some pessimism here as well. I don't uh, believe in any attempts uh, delivered by the Russian you know, journalists, even though uh, some, times, some time ago, a few years ago, I've been a, uh, a prize winner by... Uh, <laughs> Russian Union of Journalists, but that was a different uh, Russian Union of Journalists. Uh, now it's uh, uh, plays totally different game. Mm -hmm. So I don't trust that these uh, amendments, first of all, even these softening amendments would be passed through the parliament. Uh, it's not necessarily that uh, these um, um, suggestions, uh, this draft law, uh, would be accepted by the parliament because there is no mood in, in, the, in authorities to change the law or cancel this law. Uh, if you look at these provisions, they actually are, you know, brushing a little bit legislation. They are polishing it a little bit just to, you know, some uh, 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 lacunes would be uh, taken out of the legislation like... Uh, the terms of uh, uh, submitting reports or which authorities you would submit a report to this or that uh, to take out of the foreign agent, uh, foreign uh, funding um, uh, income that uh, media outlet would get uh, from advertisement online. It's nothing. It's really like uh, uh, discussing the color of your bars that you're, uh, you're sitting behind in your prison with the prison administration. It's, it's, it's not changing the situation in general. This legislation, the only uh, what could be done, it could be only canceled fully with, uh, with all my respect and not just by Russian uh, Federation because this, as long as this legislation uh, is used by other countries, it will be an argument for Russian authorities to use it as well. And uh, I would uh, uh, just point out that uh, Russian, uh, the, the, the vice minister of uh, foreign affairs of the Russian Federation in his interview to BBC uh, some time ago, like a couple of weeks uh, ago, he said that, um, mm -hmm. Let me check this word because I don't really use it in my normal life. It's a reciprocity game, like a reciprocity game. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, uh, uh, it's a kind of like if you do it, I would do it too. So and if you thought that as long as uh, uh, U.S. foreign legis law will be there, uh, Russian foreign agent law will be there and will be used. So that means uh, it's uh, we are here uh, like kidnapped in a way uh, or uh, by authorities just to, uh, to you know to be uh, some kind of instrument in this political game between our two um, countries. Unfortunately, it seems like that. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, and by the way, uh, please pay attention to the little detail in this in this petition. 
uh, they are discussing only the foreign agents law, avoiding to discuss the undesirable law, for example. It's not there. And, that, and that's very important, you know. Uh, that's why we leave the room for the authorities, uh, well, to say, like, okay, again, undesirable is okay. So that's the problem. And actually, this undesirable law can be used against anyone. It's uh, the notion is so broad and vague that uh, it could be easily used against any company in any field from any country. Person with any citizenship uh, could be affected. So this is something that is even worse than foreign agent. Okay, thank you, um, let me. Um turn to our audience in the room and ask their questions here before I um, turn to the Q&A online. Is anyone in the room? Yes, and please introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Abby Wright. I work at the journalism school, former colleague of Ann Coopers. Thank you for being here. Um, you've talked about tech companies, American tech companies, and you've talked about the Council of Europe. But you haven't mentioned a role for the Biden administration or the U.S. State Department in this situation. Is there a role for the Biden for the American government in any way in making a difference on this issue? Roman, would you take the question, or would you like me to answer? Mike, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. If you are ready, go first, please. Yeah. Um, I'll be quick, and uh, I would I would appreciate if Roman would uh, add something because he is more uh, uh, probably aware as a journalist. So I think that uh, Biden administration uh, administration of United States is, uh, clearly has a uh, strong role in this uh, because uh, big tech companies uh, are actually U.S. based and uh, being. Uh, quite big players on the market and uh, taxpayer in the United States. This is something, there is, a, there is a room for dialogue, but I don't know which one, because uh, again, it's not just about business. It's not just about money. It's about the, their role on international level. And what would be the dialogue between the country administration where uh, the co these companies are registered as businesses? And uh, uh, and themselves, uh, I, as a lawyer, I cannot answer this. I know that uh, that that countries are actually uh, could pay attention to this new um, uh, the new role, important role that big tech companies are playing uh, in internet uh, world and and on international level, which of course is used as you see by other governments to put pressure on both these companies, which are un, uh, acting under and uh, working under other, some other jurisdictions. And in, in this case, they are working under US jurisdiction. So Russian government, uh, German government, Malaysian government, they are putting pressure on US registered companies. So there is clearly some room for, um, for dialogue. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they are used to put political pressure in international relations, which also ha have to be taken into account. Uh, again, I'm 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 not in a position to give an, like full answers for this uh, from political point of view, uh, but uh, I think uh, it's uh, something that has to be discussed uh, uh, between country administration and uh, these big tech companies. Uh, Okay, very briefly, uh, I want you to understand me uh, absolutely correctly. As a journalist, I'm not in the position to ask for any kind of support from the foreign government. Uh, but I do believe that the uh, American administration and European uh, governments as well, they can do way more to, in convincing big tech companies to start dialogue with the civil society groups and journalists, and not only in Russia, in many other countries, because many other countries will face the same problems very soon. I'm talking about Turkey, I'm talking about some Latin American countries. Uh, I don't even mention China case. It's huge and uh, with a long story. 
So I believe they can do more. Yes. Um, so I, oh, my name is Danielle. Can you speak up? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where the mics are. My name is Danielle. Uh, I'm a second year student here at SIPA studying the Russian region. And uh, my question is about the public perception to these uh, foreign agent and undesirable laws. Um, the public being aware that this exists in Russia, do they trust the media? Like, are they, what, what, what is the public doing? How do they perceive this? Uh, what is their relationship with media in general? Or are they falling into Putin's camp and, you know, thinking that what the, the laws are doing, are, it's, it, that it's correct? Uh, well, uh, it's really big and important question. Uh, uh, well, uh, the thing I'm going to start with, one of the most important things about this legislation, uh, I mean, both uh, the foreign agent, the undesirables, uh, it's uncertainty and it's elective enforcement. Actually, no one in Russia understands correctly what is legal and what is illegal according to that legislation. Even those who implemented that law, for example, guys at the Kremlin or State Duma or at the law enforcement bodies, they don't understand how that law can be properly used. For example, Russia Today, RT, TV channel, you know them. Uh, strictly according to the law, they can be easily proclaimed as foreign agent because they receive some money from abroad. For example, uh, as an advertising income from YouTube. But of course, they will not do that. I mean, the Russian authorities will not proclaim RT as foreign agent. And what is really serious, this uncertainty is a deadly weapon for the Kremlin because the, un the uncertainty leads to fear. Uh, they want us to be scared and they want all the Russian people to be scared of this legislation. Uh, and well, I have to say that the Russian authorities succeeded with that. I am witnessing that so many people around us are scared. They really scared because they don't, don't know what to be prepared for. For example, on July 15th, when Project was proclaimed as undesirable, exactly at the same day, we received a number of letters from the Russian citizens asking us to delete their banking accounts details from our crowdfunding platform because people are afraid that they can be prosecuted for something that they have already done before. <laughs> That's the, the most funny thing. Uh, before the law was adopted. Uh, in legal terms, it is called retroaction, right? Uh, and I have nothing to blame that people for. Everything is possible uh, in the authoritarian state. And now we see how Russian authorities prosecute, for example, Navalny supporters for the crimes they committed years before. <laughs> years before that act became a crime. So, and I... Unfortunately, I see that the journalists are afraid to collaborate with us. Our sources are afraid to talk to us, even using the secure channels as signal. And the average people are afraid to post, to repost our information in their social media accounts. This is the most depressing result an important result uh, of this legislation. It's kind of atmosphere of fear. Uh, and, you know, talking to my old, older colleagues, I understand this atmosphere of fear has very much in common uh, with that of the late Soviet Union, like in late uh, 70s. Everybody are afraid of bad consequences. So, is it the answer? Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to take a question from the Q&A. Um, one of the, Camilo Dominguez, 
um, asks, again, this topic we've been talking about, whether the Russian foreign agent law, um, at least initially, was a legal counterpart to foreign similar ones, US legislation, for instance, or was it intended from the beginning to fight against Russian internal uh, betrayers so in other words, was it used from the beginning to go after political enemies? So we've touched on that a little bit. And uh, relatedly, um, Camilo Dominguez asks, what about pro-Kremlin journalists? How many are there? Are the majority of them active journalists? And how do they deal with their persecuted colleagues? Do they try to build any kind of solidarity with persecuted colleagues or are they indifferent to their fate? Are they not afraid that they might be the next foreign agents as the regime closes even more? Uh, well, answering this question in the most brief way, I would say, well, the propaganda machine in Russia is really huge and it costs like billions of rubles every year uh, for Russian taxpayers. Uh, we have a enormous amount of uh, state-run media organization across the country. Uh, in average, every region in Russia has up to 50 officially registered state-run media organization. This number is really huge. And many of them uh, have none of independent ones uh, in that regions. Uh, that's a problem. And answering your question, are they ready to collaborate or to show their solidarity? No, of course, no. We are enemies. They are right and we are enemies. It's like the position of the most of them. Let me add to this. Uh, on the federal level, 100% uh, uh, of TV channels are state owned or state controlled. So there is no independent uh, TV content other than TV Dost, TV Rain, which uh, is not on uh, TV box, it's uh, online because uh, they, the legislation has been changed and the TV Dost cannot, which Roman was editor in chief some time ago. Uh, it's, uh, now it's available only online and majority of Russian society is not actually seeing uh, it's not they're not watching this uh, TV channel. Uh, they uh, have subscri subscriptions. People are not have uh, not ready to pay for the content, media content. So unfortunately, uh, Russian society actually divided into two information bubbles. One receives information just from TV and uh, state media and the other from independent sources, social media and independent online media groups and uh, outlets. So, and these uh, people, they live in different countries. So and they, that, that's the perception. They do feel like total different set of facts are, and uh, events are happening. Uh, totally different um, assessment of this, uh, of uh, what is happening in the country, uh, different experts. Sometimes uh, they, they just uh, don't know of certain uh, events which were, was reported in, inter, in international media and independent media because the Russian state media simply avoids uh, these topics. So that, that's why people just, they don't understand each other. They, they literally, they almost like live in different countries. Uh, and uh, uh, answering question about uh, solidarity, we are, Mass Media Defense Center that I lead uh, takes uh, uh, a lot of uh, cases on behalf of Russian journalists, uh, all sorts of cases, not just related to media law and content regulation or, or registration of media or defamation, privacy. We also take criminal cases. And criminal cases uh, and cases of foreign agents they are actually those uh, which you can use as examples of uh, uh, some, some uh, answer from the media community, whether there is solidarity or not. In criminal cases, we do see some solidarity. And uh, it's actually incredible because uh, journalists are showing solidarity more than ever, but 
there are no state journalists, state media related journalists. They are afraid to show, to show solidarity, even if they do understand what is going on. I, I, I hope they do, actually, I, I, I think they do, but they would not um, say anything. They will continue their work uh, getting this uh, state uh, budget salaries uh, and their position is really um, um, well, easy. I have family, I have uh, mortgage to pay, I have kids, I don't need these problems. Uh, and nothing, nothing like personal is just my, my job. I'm doing this job and uh, this is your word, not mine, um, not mine. And uh, they, we cannot count on their solidarity, unfortunately. So it's only those who are working in an independent media, they are actually waking up and they are grouping and trying to show solidarity when it's needed. But it's still, it's on the level of uh, the country. It's um, not that many people, like uh, we've been uh, defending uh, well-known uh, regional journalist Svetlana Prokopyeva, who was charged with uh, justification of terrorism in the Pskov region uh, for just uh, her articles about one of the terrorist uh, attacks when, where she tried to uh, uh, think in her publication of reasons why that uh, terrorist attack happened. What was the, what the state did the, or did not uh, to avoid that mm -hmm. happen. Uh, and uh, so she uh, was uh, charged with the justification of terrorism and she, sh she was facing up to seven years of imprisonment and up to two years of ban for profession. And, uh, and that's not in Moscow, that was uh, in a uh, remote region. And uh, we show on, we, we've seen uh, an unusual, example of solidarity where, where <laughs> from different regions, uh, including Moscow and St. Petersburg, in the middle of pandemic in, Ju in June 2020, they went to support her and they've been standing in front of the regional courts uh, waiting for judgments to be announced. So that was, uh, but it was like one of the very few examples. Ivan Golunov was the other one in Moscow. Uh, but that's like, uh, you know, we, we cannot, uh, show these examples as, as like a tendency, as something that might change media landscape, unfortunately. It's something else has to change, happen that media would, uh, would say enough. Uh, probably not, not the foreign agent designation or und even undesirables, something else. Mm -hmm. and, by, and by the way, so, sorry, can I add some sure. very short and very picturesque detail on the question of solidarity from the uh, state-run journalists. Uh, just imagine every time when Russian law enforcement bodies uh, enter the apartment of any activist to search this apartment, the, they have the TV crew or at least a cameraman attached from the RT or any other Russian state-run TV station. Just imagine cameraman with every uh, and every search. For example, it was like uh, when my apartment was searched in June, they have even two cameras, two cameramen, uh, and they were filming everything inside my apartment without any uh, authorization or something like that. And that, that was people sanded by sent by the state-run TV stations. They did have an authorization by investigative team. So they yeah. didn't have an authorization. That actually, uh, again, shows a lot how this uh, whole system of state media works, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes, and the example is most of the story, right? They're using the example and the film of what's going on inside your apartment, Raman, to scare um, and to, to cause other journalists to self-censor or to be really careful. So let me, um, I think for our last question, let me kind of combine something I'm thinking about with a question by Jonathan Sanders here, who is asking about, um, well, he's characterizing what's going on with Memorial and saying there's a lack of response in the East and the West. 
um, and isn't this surprising? And what would Sakharov say? What would Yeltsin say? And um, and then he kind of compares the present moment to um, um, some um, period during the Soviet period under Brezhnev. But I, I, I want to ask a little bit your take on what's happening with Memorial and kind of combine it with this question about um, other journalists by asking you about, I understand what you're saying, Galina, and you really laid out very clearly the bubbles and the two worlds, even the two information worlds that people live in in Russia with regard to official journalism and state television versus independent media. But I, I wanted to ask about what about people covering cultural issues or his, okay, historical issues? You can see that some of the lines are pretty clear, right? There was this television. I mean, there was this rapper a few weeks ago who criticized the World War II victory parade and got into trouble um, um, for his comments about who really needs this kind of victory parade. So with history, people and journalists might self-censor a bit, but what about um, the coverage of journalists in the cultural sphere where maybe it's not so clear cut which kinds of um, culture or plays or, or high culture really constitute um, a, um, a, a kind of challenge to the dominant conservative values that the regime is promoting. Might there be a little bit of a connection between these two information worlds um, when it comes to high culture? And apropos and circling back to this question by Jonathan Sanders about Memorial, uh, we see that there was a um, open letter signed by cultural figures and artists recently to challenge the um, legal pressure being put on Memorial. So I just wanted to hear your take on, um, you know, how you perceive what's happening with Mor Memorial and if whether there could be any kind of um, way to reach across this kind of information chasm in Russia uh, by using a discussion not about politics or about corruption in a formal sense, but about these kinds of cultural issues and what's allowed to be discussed and what isn't allowed to be discussed, um, including what pop cultural figures like rappers might have to say um, and how, um, you know, that, that might be some kind of op broader conversation that could happen um, among Russian actors in the present time. Well, I'll start and uh, I, I would ask Raman to uh, back up me because this is uh, a bit, uh, um, uh, it's a difficult question, uh, to be honest. And I, today, I, just today I talked to director of uh, Memorial Human Rights Center, Anna Dobrovolska, and uh, uh, I also had this impression that there is not not that much of um, um, reply and uh, some feedback from the international community on this uh, absolutely horrible uh, step to um, uh, to demolish one of the the most respected uh, Russian NGOs, which uh, which works in different fields in culture, historical, and legal. Uh, and human rights field. And uh, it seems that she knows more about this, of course, than I do. And uh, she says, she, she said that they they are involved in some, you know, uh, mm -hmm. discussion on that, uh, including on the, on the level of uh, Council of Europe and Parliamentary Assembly. But uh, I myself uh, didn't see uh, strong reaction of international community on, on this, uh, the, this news, this move of uh, Russian authorities. And uh, uh, as a lawyer, I do understand that any statement of like uh, uh, hands off uh, memorial and uh, don't do this, don't put pressure, that won't be taken as, uh, uh, by authorities uh, as uh, um, the, the warning, like a strong political warning that uh, that would be just uh, taken as okay. Another press release uh, by another organization. Uh, we'll just ignore it. Uh, it should be something different uh, than just uh, a statement that we are concerned. We're deeply concerned. We're deeply, deeply concerned. As uh, usually, uh, you know, diplomats and even NGOs are doing using this this wording. But um, um, I think that uh, actions taken against Memorial is uh, a sign signal to all of us because we thought we, for, for some time, we thought that 
uh, if authorities would uh, start demolishing elimination of the whole Russian civil society, they probably would, would start from small regional organizations. Mm -hmm. No, they started from the very top. Mm -hmm. And uh, they started from something which is like, a, it, it's not just a history of Russian human rights movement. Uh, Memorial is working on a topic which is crucial and it's really painful for Russian society, uh, topic of repressions and memory of Gulag and uh, those who, who've lost family members in repressions uh, for the last you know, 70 years, uh, more than 70 years. So they started from this. So this history is not wanted, not welcomed by authority. The saving of this uh, history is not, uh, uh, is not, it doesn't come well with the modern um, approaches in politics. Uh, and it seems that uh, my perception is that it seems that uh, this, uh, um, this, this, this move is actually to help uh, uh, presidential administration and authorities in general to restore the um, um, algorithm in the country similar to Soviet Union. And of course, uh, all the, all the wording and uh, the work of memorial is actually uh, goes in an opposite way basically to say, to to show the problems and uh, uh, strong human rights violation accumulation of citizens uh, during soviet time uh, by using re re repressive uh, repressions uh, as an instrument and uh, this is something that is in conflict with uh, um, with communication between the authorities and uh, civil society. Uh, that's why Memorial is, uh, un, uh, as, is a first target, but uh, that probably is the, the, the start, but not the, the, the finish. It uh, probably will be used, similar approaches will be used against other uh, human rights organiza organizations. And uh, I would uh, underline that uh, as a legal reasoning behind it is a violation of uh, foreign agent law. And the, the claim filed by the prosecutor general is so cynical. If you read it, uh, it's unbelievable. They actually uh, refer to that refer to international obligations of Russian Federation, which uh, Russia is trying to fulfill by uh, closing activity of memorial because memorial, the, well, general prosecutor claims that memorial systematically violated the right to information of Russian public uh, by hiding uh, uh, the fact that they've been uh, uh, designated as foreign agents because they missed some disclaimers on their publications online. So that was actually the reasoning and they referred to European Convention of Human Rights and even a convention to protection of uh, kids' rights, the children's rights because children uh, children's rights have been violated by the fact that they've been reading information posted by Memorial and they didn't know that this information was disseminated by the foreign agent. So that, that's, that was a uh, harm uh, uh, for their, their rights, their development and health. That's, that's how the, uh, the claim was actually legally supported. Raman, the floor is yours. What's your opinion on that? Uh, well, in a very brief way, as a journalist, I see the memorial case as the end of a long time, sometimes cold, sometimes hot war uh, against memorial, uh, which the FSB waged for years. Uh, they hate toward memorial has a very long history and mostly because of what is memorial doing in researching the role of Soviet security services in repressions. Uh, and we witnessed a lot of examples of this hate. Uh, I can remember, for example, the very infamous case of Yuri Dmitriev in Karelia region who was the head of the regional memorial branch uh, and he was prosecuted 
all of a sudden on pedophily case because years before this, uh, he discovered the names of the um, executors who uh, like uh, who made executions in Karelia of thousands of uh, Soviet people. And well, it's not a surprise that uh, the FSB is the most influential group of elite in nowadays Russia. Uh, and it's not a secret that they have Mr. Andropov and Mr. Dzerzhinsky and sometimes even Mr. Beria as their idols and their role models. Uh, they still admire them. Uh, and that's why it's in their logics, it's very uh, logical to prosecute Memorial right now and right away. Uh, Answering the part of your question, is it more safe for journalists to cover cultural uh, agenda and so? Well, I would say, just imagine, Memorial has nothing to do with the current actual politics in Russia. Uh, they were not involved in covering like uh, politics, uh, Mr. Putin and uh, all that guys. But they did a lot and they had a lot of media partners covering uh, historical topics, like who did the executions in Perm region 50 years ago. And that's why, because of all these articles, they were prosecuted. I strongly believe in that. And uh, answering your question in a more, more broad way, I would say like, now we are saying we, I mean Russian journalists, we are in the most dramatic point. It's never been easy. It's never been happy, happy times. But the speed of worsening is really fast right now. And that's why I believe that it's impossible uh, to stay safe trying to cover like we are covering only business agenda or we are covering only cultural agenda. They will come for all of us one day, maybe later, maybe sooner. Uh, but, uh, well, it's inevitable. I mean, every, uh, every, every one of us are under threat. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate how much time you're giving us. And I know um, we're we're past the end point. I just want to ask you one last question from Musa Klebnikov. Uh, well, she has two questions. Well, which independent media is the most effective in getting news to the public in Russia? And two, should there be a Russian journalist abroad organization as there cannot be one, an independent one in Russia? Um, and how can the tech companies vet who is a legitimate journalist? Um, maybe if you want to take the question about Russian journalists abroad and organization. I know we touched on this a little bit, but if you have any final thoughts on that, and then we'll, and then we'll bring this to a, um, a close. Okay, uh, I strongly believe that right now we are in the very beginning of new era of Russian journalism, and the new feature uh, of this era is we need to learn how to operate from abroad. We need to. Uh, set up our operations from abroad. Uh, and I believe it's doable. Uh, and many of us, as I mean, Russian journalists and in investigators, first of all, uh, we are already abroad and we are trying to start our, our operations from here. It's not easy, but um, it's inevitable again. Galina, any final thoughts? that you want to contribute? I don't know. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure if we can hear you, Galina, right now. Um, so, yeah, a few yeah. technical problems. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, all right, well. <laughs> I, okay, I just wanted to express um, our deepest thanks to both of you. I'm not sure if she's no longer present um, for participating and giving us so much of your time um, and your um, um, 
really hard one personal experience that you shared with us today. Um, uh, one of our one of our guests online says um, that you uh, Olga Kravtseva says you are an example of resiliency, which is a great support and inspiration. And I just want to echo that. Um, so on behalf of everyone who attended today and on behalf of a much broader audience out there that really relies on independent journalism in Russia. Um, thank you, Roman. Thank you, Galina. Um, and uh, um, we really wish you all the best. We can't even convey in words uh, how we feel about this subject and about what's going on in Russia right now. Um, so thank you again. And if you have any um, final comments, Galina, since you we lost you for a minute, um, yep. you know, please share. Um, just uh, probably not, nothing to add. We had uh, quite um um interesting uh, but depressing conversation uh, i just hope that we will face uh, in uh, hopefully in the next future time when uh, journalists will be back to russia and uh, uh, and will be able to report freely and uh, with uh, um, all respect to um, mission of journalists and uh, we, we wouldn't face these uh, challenges that we face now and i i really appreciate uh, your efforts to provide us possibility to share our opinion and thanks for inviting. Thank you so much. That's a Anne. great note to close on. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Anne. And thanks to everyone for coming.